What does it take to become an elite 40K player? How do the top competitors overcome bad dice? The Competitive 40K Network presents Art of War Unbroken. Insight into the game plans of the top players on the planet with your hosts, Blake Law and the Art of War Coaches. Welcome to Art of War Unbroken. Champions may lose, but spirits are never broken. I have not watched the <laughs> intro enough times to do it. Well, the spirits um, remain unbroken. We take elite players that have lost one or two games in a major and bring them on to talk about what we learn from that loss because of the biggest thing is learning you might blame the dice i don't blame them on dice of course but quentin does all the time all the time yeah the time. i never make any tactical mistakes i've never never i am here blake is now under the weather he got hit by a meteor a dinosaur or something else happened but we're gonna have him on next we are joined by the man with the pinkest hair in 40k it's not even it's Clearing at me right now. If only this I did, it, I did it yesterday for ATC. It's going to be great. My team jersey is pink. My hair is pink. I got pink shoes for the event. So I don't I'm even know like, what's happening. I'm very excited about this. Say hello yeah. to everybody. It's Quentin Johnson. Quentin Rand Johnson. I still don't know where that's from. It's been like a year now. <laughs> not, not a big MMA fan. We've got Mr. Scott here. Stop playing from the great white north, just coming from the show me showdown. Where we had one misstep, but we came back to drop elbows on the rest of the entire scene. How are you doing today, brother? I'm doing good. How are yourself? I am tired. I'm getting ready for ATC. We had to actually put things in. I want everybody to know uh, this will be released afterwards, so I might be a fool. I have a $50 bet with Nick that there's no way he's winning four games with the dumpster fire of a Dark Eldar list he took. Can I? Can Is that I the one you guys question? share today? <laughs> yes. <laughs> on the stream? Oh, God. I love Nick's list so much. I was having a really bad day when it got released, and it made my day so much better because I it knew is. it was going to be something dumb, but I didn't know it was going to be three tantaluses. Three tantalus dumb. That's that's hard. It's hard to beat on that. I was like, uh, I it was either that or I think he was going to bring back crew mercenaries from uh, fifth edition. <laughs> so I was waiting for the text from Jack just to be how many crew do you own? Oh, jeez. The that's answer is forty. <laughs> I just, those are rookie numbers. I need to pump those up. No. Tell me about this this tournament. We went to the Show Me Showdown. Uh, tell me about it. Where was it? How was it? What what kind of style was it? Yeah, uh, Show Me Showdown is a six-round event in Kansas City, Missouri. This is the sixth or seventh year that they've run it now. Nate Martin is the TO. It's part of the Lord Marshall Conference, which is the Midwest Conference of Tournaments. It's the largest one. It's 109 players. Yeah, it's, it's a good time. Really good event. Lots of, nice. they got a nice bar right outside, so. Oh, it's right, it's right you had me a bar right outside. <laughs> so, so was this a player place terrain? Was this set terrain? Was this GW terrain? What were we playing on this week? Uh, it's, it's set terrain. This was actually set terrain, not GW style, but they kind of, in the past few years, they've just done the set terrain, even though uh, other terms have kind of moved to player placed. Was it so. set that changed with the, uh, with the mission or was it just a straight set static tables? Uh, straight static tables. Yeah, it was, yeah, and they did preview some of it. There's some, there's some decent shooting lanes on some of the deployment zones the way it would be but they had two large runes that were near the center just outside your deployment zones that uh they they made the rule that their big their bigger pieces of ruins would be first level line of sight blocking so that was kind of key in part of my list design in that that's so. a that's a very big thing out of all those terrain styles what would you rate your favorites like in order on that Player place is what I'm most experienced with, and I, I like that. I enjoy it. You know, it allows me to set up the terrain as I need it to be for my specific army. And then uh, probably GW, and then and then this kind of static stuff. It's kind of just random. Like at, the upper tables were much better than the lower tables. If you got, if you were down below, like in the bottom half, bottom you know 25 tables, they were a little bit more sparse than they were in the top tables. So I can see that. What about yourself, Quinn? Uh, in terms of what terrain I like, yep. I love player place because, as Scott said, it gives you the avenues that you need to set up what you need depending on your army. Like when I was playing Drakari, I'd have all my ruins like in the middle that I knew I could advance to them and then use them as launching pads out to my opponent now that i'm playing hammerhead tau i put them all in the back so i have these long firing lanes for my giant rail guns to shoot whatever i need to shoot after that it's gw because gw is so predictable you can build a list around it i was on a while ago talking about my um wraith guard or wraith blade list and that requires gw terrain just because the way their tactics worked um and then after that is static terrain because it's 
such a crap shot, you don't know what you're going to get. 100% on that. It's weird because I'm I'm exactly the opposite. If, 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 if you have really good TOs that know the game, my personal favorite for speed is static that moves with the mission. But that really requires that you have a good tournament with a lot of terrain that's very equal. And I would actually rather have all of the tables be equal, you know, completely equal and change it per uh, just because it saves me a little bit of time. And you can get games where it feels like if you have an experienced player that plays with player place terrain, you can get some very games that are like, well, this is kind of over because you're not used to placing this, especially if you have that. Per- that's why I tell everybody measure first, measure all your terrain first before you place the first one. And you see that person go, I've got this giant line of sight blocker. I'm going to put it right in the middle. And then they realize, oh no, I can't put anything on my objectives anymore. This is going to be a bad game. You're like, yes, it is. Yeah. I, I don't think you can, you can't win a game when you're placing terrain in player place, but you can definitely lose the game. I would say you can't, you can't deploy. I do the same with their deployment. You can't deploy to win, but you can't deploy to not lose. So I've had moments where you have a shooting army versus a combat army, and there's a giant two-foot trench in the middle between the two armies, and (laughs) that game's over. You're going to have some tough times. So it's a Tau versus Blood Angels, and there's 24 inches of open space. Well, uh, enjoy. It's going to be a good time. (laughs) Played that one before. Scott, tell me a little bit of the list you took, and give me a little bit of... uh, You said that there was some things that you had in it because you knew what the terrain was going to be. So give us that uh, those insights to that, too, if you could, please. Nate Martin, the TO, had posted up some uh, pictures of what some of the example tables were going to look like. Um, So looking at those, you were kind of able to see that there was going to be some decent sized ruins, most objectives, if not all the objectives. And then also, as you got towards the middle, there would be bigger line of sight blocking one that you can move out to. So I had played Necrons in the past and with the changes to Nephilim and Nephilim with Necrons, it was just kind of an easy choice for me to go back to them. And with that pregame move you could just move your whole army out into that middle ruin and then you can just threaten you know basically the whole board with you know i I took a lot of fast moving small gribbly units that could just challenge every objective and i'm obsec everywhere or double obsec in my warriors so it was really easy to get out there and just go steal objectives from people It, it, it was kind of amazing like how how you could just stage up in certain spots it was kind of set up perfectly for this you know especially if you go first it was even worse then so i have the silent king he's kind of an auto take for necrons right now and then i took a chronomancer with the veil of darkness he has the entropic lance, which is like a basically a dark lance, eighteen inch dark lance. Twenty warriors, uh, a score, five, a unit of five scorpic destroyers, three by five camtech wraiths, three by three obsidian destroyers, and two by three uh, scarabs, a technomancer, and then three heavy locust destroyers. And what was our uh, tradition? What were you looking at? Were you obsec? Oh, I'm uh, yeah, obsec in uh, pregame move. Yeah, we. I feel that people just assume that at this point in time. It's just, it's so good though, and it plays so well into their secondaries. Ah, your list is so annoying too. I love it. Yep. I just, there's nothing that makes you sadder than when like two random scarab units give you a zero on primary. You're like, hmm. So uh, those guys cost about a nickel, right? You're like, yeah, pretty much. Yep. (laughs) You're like, uh. So we've got. Well, actually, let's talk about the other list you played against. Uh, Chaos Knights. Um, so he was running in a, a Knight Abominant. It was uh, House Herpetrax, which is the additional wounds. That one always messes with me because it, it messes with my math for what it takes to actually kill a knight <laughs> normally. And then he had a Desecrator with, uh, can't remember what the name of that gun is, but it's like the Strength 14 two shot gun. Um, oh, then he had. Thing, the laser. Thing. Yeah. 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 Like D6. It's six plus D3 or something. When he told me what it did, it was like, all right, the Silent King can't go anywhere near that guy because he's going to die. <laughs> that guy. <laughs> that guy. Uh, then he had two War Dog Executioners, one with the Meltagon, one with the, I think yeah, one of them had like the, the Gatlin Cannon. Then he had two Carnivores and then uh, three War Dog Stalkers. Well, and then the, one of the Carnivores had the Blood Shield, which when he would proc that, then he could ignore Invulns, which uh, that, that, that came into play. <laughs> yeah, I just played that the other day, as a matter of fact. It's very annoying. You know who really doesn't like to see that? Howling Banshees. <laughs> <laughs> hey, wait, you don't oh, like no. it either. <laughs> yeah. I was just I was like, oh, well, that's gonna hurt. So what kind of what mission were we playing? What secondaries? What did your opponent take if you could remember? Yeah, so it was conversion, uh, which is the the five objective missions. So I took uh, ancient machineries, uh, bring it down, and then treasures of Aeon. Because those are kind of the... I figured, I thought about Purge the Vermin, but with some of his knights, I, I'm not super confident in my ability to actually kill knights. It's more, they're going to survive and they're going to get in, they're going to be in like three zones most of the game. So I knew that one wasn't necessarily a great choice for me. So, um, and then he chose 
I think it's Ruthless Tyranny. Is that the one where like they control object? They do some stuff with objectives. They get basically four points a turn, roughly. He took the challenge one or fitting challenge where like he kills my three most expensive units. They literally have reverse to the last. <laughs> yeah. Yep. And he took no prisoners as well. So that one, uh, that's kind of an easy max against my army. Yeah, I, I was just say you have all of the wounds. If I reanimate anything during the game, they pretty much get it. So I, I do want to say that besides the, the glowing pink hair, I'm super mad that you guys can't see Quentin right now because he also has what looks to be like a fireside gathering. Like, I feel like he's going to read me a story right now. <laughs> Your background is primo right now. I am home right now. And so I am in the my house's podcast studio for once instead of my college dorm room. Ugh. So you can. It I can't is, see the rest of it, but like, hold on. If I turn the, I got some stuff set up earlier. Oh, I love this. I got a luminar watching us. It, it's it's fantastic. Yeah, I know it's great. I, I I feel calm and serene for Quentin's background. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna take this moment and I'm gonna tell Scott that I hate you because you have 15 wraiths in this list and Canoptic wraiths are now my number one most hated unit in the game. <laughs> They've shot way up. Because I've had way too many times where a unit of five of those little buggers will just scoot on out like way too far after their six inch pregame move and then charge me and they'll be obsec all on my objectives and then I'll kill two or three and they'll come back and then I just hate them with a burning passion. So now they're priority number one think, for me to kill. One of the things for everybody that doesn't know this on that, they can leave and charge something else, which is yep. horrific, actually. So when you don't kill him and the rest of your backfield goes you guys were supposed to take care of them, and then they're back there somewhere. You're like you 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 did not you jumped right over the red the red rope. You were not supposed to go over here. This is clearly marked as not not to hang out. So going into this match, do you know a decent amount about the Chaos Knights? How did you feel about the match? This was like my fourth or fifth game into them. I I had previously been playing Tau, so I wasn't too terribly concerned about Chaos Knights with Tau. But uh, with Necrons, there's the two matchups. I, there's probably three matchups I was most worried with with my version of Necrons, and Death Guard was probably my most concern, actually, because Armor Contempt and then the Neg 1 damage, most of my stuff hits like a wet noodle into that. So, And then Chaos Knights was an issue. I don't have that much Strength 8 in combat outside of like the outside of the Silent King and the Scorpic Destroyers. There's, there's no Strength 8. It's all Strength 7. So if they have a way to turn off my rerolls, I'm I'm in big trouble because that's that's kind of the whole key is and, the Silent and, King just because rerolls a wound on everything. Don't go to that big guy in the middle because he will <laughs> I, I feel like every cast night if you if you build in battle scribe right now one of your guys gets no rerolls on your big yeah, the guy tra the trans hitman guy thing yeah yeah it's just it's it's period it's in there it's insane it might be the best re one of the best relics in the game is yep. it relic or more like whatever i think it's uh it's an it's like the points upgrade oh yeah, yeah it's, like it's actually upgrade. a yeah. block thing bad. i'm just making stuff up i just know it's there it no it's i i just assume whenever i see a knight abominant i just i i just assume, yeah. I, for a while i thought that was what it came with because everyone was running it <laughs> it is funny actually because yeah. of the fact you're like yep. it, you're just not re-rolling against that guy and you just know that but I just it's, people, it. people could stop actually running that on their guys because you just assume that they have it so you're just not going to re-roll <laughs> so so you set the stage for us you, you're a little bit uh trepidatious about the the matchup because you don't know if you can kill them did you think you had enough uh just movement and blocking though because it feels like you've got so much stuff in there that it feels yeah. like what was, your, what was your strategy basically what was your game plan going in how am i winning this game so my game plan was like was going to be kind of just move up i ended up getting top i ended up getting first turn if i got in second turn it would have been a change a little bit with gaffing first turn my game plan was going out and so turn one i just sent scarabs out to the two to the middle objective and the far and one of the far objectives and i put race up five race up on the other one that he only had one big knight up there that was going to move over towards that and it's not obsec so the wraiths would hopefully survive for a couple turns up there hold that he couldn't Actually, because of the way the runes were set up, he couldn't just walk straight out to it turn one. He had about a 10-inch charge he needed to make to get there. So my top one, I got five for Aeons, four for Ancient Machineries. I did the middle objective initially with Ancient Machineries because I knew he was moving the bulk of his force right there. And then uh, I didn't get anything for bringing it down that first turn, but that, that kind of started to set the stage there. And, and it kind of Necrons, it's kind of, you get this big <laughs> lead initially and hold on because <laughs> you're going to get tabled. <laughs> you know, just... Try to score as much as you can early and just uh, make your opponent try and come back on it. So probably in the game, though, my biggest mistake was I moved my warriors up a little too close to him. Turn one, I, there was a, a crater near the middle and I was st staged behind it. And it was my mistake. I didn't ask him, but I didn't realize that his big knight could actually ignore difficult ground. <laughs> so he charged right through it. And I didn't think he'd kill 20 warriors in combat, but he did. 
<laughs> with 305 up in I, home, so I feel like the narrator's like, and that's when he thought things were going to go well, and they did not. Yeah, and and that was one of my challenge ones, so I, I lost one of my challenge ones right away. In hindsight, I would not have been that aggressive with those Warriors. I would have kept them back a little bit, a little bit longer. Looking at the game itself, do you think you could have played a more passive style during the game at that point in time then? You said you were a little bit too far up on that. Yeah, I, I think mean, I could have just, I think I could have just stayed back and just sent out those three units and just let those go and not really set the stage, because I have Veil of Darkness if I needed to move the Warriors to get into position to be able to like throw down on his big night. Um, I was just very concerned. Of, that was the night with the with the laser destructor that I was very concerned about like getting Linus out of my Silent King because that's my uh, one of my other challenge ones. So I didn't want him to uh, be able to take that one out. So, so at the end, what was the end score at this? Let's we'll bounce to the end a little bit, but um, he won seventy five seventy four. So. Yes, I was about to say I I thought that's what I saw when I looked at the score. I I actually know what the score was. I just want to hear it out loud because it's <laughs> it was a it was the tiny thing. We'll talk more about the specifics of it when we get into part two, otherwise known as the Bradning or even after hours. But <laughs> would you have made a change in like but looking back? We'll talk about more things when we go into the part two, so that. But as far as just you you said you would have gone a little more passive deployment wise and initial setup. Did you feel that you were in a good spot or did you feel that I should be some, you know, someplace a little bit different as you first started to play that game. We've- yeah. I mean, I guess I felt like I was in a good position, but hindsight being 2020, knowing like having played Tau in the Chaos Knights previously, I didn't, I had totally spaced on their negative one damage strat in close combat. So that was also very painful when I, when I, when he popped that on me. So I had staged in that mill ruin where I was pretty well hidden with all of my destroyers and everything. So I was, I had a bunch I could throw down on him, but um, I think if I just pulled back further and made him just come to me, take two turns to come at me, gives the Silent King a couple turns to shoot at some of the littler knights and as well as the Locust Destroyers. Um, but they kind of, Locust Destroyers, I uh, preview, they're they're not going to be around much longer. <laughs> they're just, yes, just, they're they're just too swingy. Know. I hate them, by the way, for the passion. They either just murder something or just die. I just, I just don't like anything. I don't like random shots for one. Uh, well, with, they're they're one the, shot each, but they. No, just... I'm saying that you've got. Well, I'm sorry. It's it's random damage, and you've got in, in the necrons right now for your shooting units. You've got guys with random shots, and you've got the random damage. Some yeah. of the guys have both of them, yeah. and it's like I I, I don't want to ride the roller coaster of what happens. You know what I mean? D you know, six shots, D six damage. Yeah. Is it I mean, one just, or thirty six? Let's yeah. find out. <laughs> it's so crazy to me sometimes. Yep. You're just like, how did they perform? You're like, I want to talk about it. <laughs> like, <you're, laughs> Honestly, there was ga- like I'd go talk to like my buddies after the games, and there was games where, like, oh, what do your local stories do? Well, they died top bottom of one, and then the other, <laughs> next, you know, it's like what they do this game. Well, they well they picked up two hammerheads, you know. It's like it's crazy to me on that. It's just I, I'm such a I w- I would rather actually take a less powerful unit that gives me consistent damage than something when I'm rolling damage and stuff because nothing drives me crazier than getting especially if you have random shots getting one shot than doing one damage you're like what happened you're like well I could have actually picked up a knight but what happened is I didn't kill a marine you know, like so <laughs> so I could either do 36 or one damage I, I'm not sure which one it's gonna be yet so hey, I'll get back they're to they're core now though so it's true. <laughs> For some reason. Well, with your Necrons, tell me about that. Tell me how about you feel. You, you switch under Necrons. We've got the big change. We've got the new secondaries. We've got point overhauls. Tell me what you were thinking going into the Necrons. What was what made you excited to jump back from just murdering everybody with Tau? And everybody, of course, loves you playing Tau because everybody loves Tau. <laughs> yeah, so I had played, I had been playing Drukhar. I played in Necrons when uh, 8th edition first dropped because nobody wanted the Necron half of the starter box. So I got like four or five of them for like dirt cheap. <laughs> <laughs> You're just giving them away, basically. Basically, you know, you get like two hundred dollars worth of models for fifty bucks, you know. So I, I built up a list, and then I actually was doing pretty well at tournaments with them. And then uh, Liquefire Drugar came out, and that was a bad time, not fun at all. So I was like, you could go on the shelf, and I'll play something else for a while, <laughs> you know. <laughs> and uh, you know, with the changes here at the points drops, they finally came back to the point where they were at a point where I wanted to play them again. I felt like they were good. Um, the secondary game is is pretty insane, and I'm the type of player that I like to know my secondary game going into the game. I don't want to like go, oh, I hope to God they give up something, or else I don't have a game here. Where Necrons, I mean, their secondaries, all four of them are viable. Um, nice. I think you have to build a little bit for color combat, but the other three are just you half you the and, games just take them. <laughs> yeah, you and sisters are basically arguing over who's got the best stuff for secondaries for sure. It's just crazy time. Yep. Did you think that the changes to command protocols made them 
the, something that you actually pay attention to now? Yes, I actually use them now. Before, I was just like, well, turn one, I'm going to get an extra inch of movement. The rest of the turns, I don't know what it does. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> You're like, oh yeah, I have a deck of cards over here. I should look, but I don't care. And honestly, uh, like the first couple, like the first game, like I had the first few practice games back with it, I was like, oh, that's right, I got to remember command protocols. Those exist. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, with the command protocols, like I, in general, I was running the plus one strength on the charge, our charge, or heroic intervene because I'm just such a melee heavy army that just it's so critical with uh, some of my units getting up to strength seven or getting up to strength five on some of the stuff, and even the warriors going up to strength five was just is, was big. And then uh, then I do like the plus two because my warlord trade i could repeat one of them with the silent king so i'd repeat uh the plus one move turn one and turn two most times and then i'd keep in my my because the silent king has a one that in your beginning battle round you can swap in uh a command protocol that isn't being used and the one i would keep out would be uh the fall back and shoot in case my warriors got tagged then i could just get them out and then i could just fall back and blast them you know with the silent king stand there full rerolls you know the neg one is not really that big of a deal and he's huge on that just i mean we, we've we talked about this a million times and every time you've seen anything in art of war full rerolls is uh is a pretty big deal yeah and, yep. pretty good yeah and his aura being able to give everybody full rerolls to wound um is just it's insane there was in one game when i went into played in the tier and it's in the last round five scorpix went into like six warriors and the silent king went into five warriors by himself with like some ophidians and because of the fight last and then he, the scorpix just flipped the the transhuman didn't matter because they're rerolling all their wounds so it's you're still wounding at a very very good rate with that full rerolls yeah go ahead Quinn. yeah so i have a question for you when we talked very briefly about this before every time i look at the silent king just Someone is who does not play Necrons and is looking at them now that they're new and improved. Um, I see the really high price tag of the Silent King, and I see Necron players running this kind of like, I have obsec everywhere, and my goal is to have these amazing secondaries and just take points and, and die. I keep wondering, would it be better to have 400 or so points of other stuff and remove the Silent King? Like, do you think he adds his value to the list? Is he is he you said he was like super critical. You think that's true? Yeah, I do. So his auras is like, I mean, he's a full page in the codex for all of his abilities. Uh, he's a fights last. He's the only source of fights last in the codex that is worth using. They're the only one I know of, to be honest. And then uh, the Meneers are just like some good quality shooting. Two shots, strength 12, minus four, flat six. Um, he does some pretty good, sh- pretty good shooting on his own. His other stuff, I think he has like three shots of strength eight nine shots at strength five so you can pick up some horde stuff his combat is actually quite quality too and with the full rerolls to hit and hit and shooting and full rerolls to wound it becomes very consistent as well (laughs) as what he does to the stuff around him so um so like destroyers like their big thing is they're um wired for haywire for destruction or wired for destruction where they get to reroll ones to hit all the time he throws my will be done out on two of them now they're hitting out twos rerolling ones and then they throw out, then they reroll all their wounds when they're around him too. So it's very consistent. Everything rerolls. So he's also, I mean, my will be done is not something to shake a stick at too. Plus, when they hit, is huge. Yeah. Yep. And it's in combat and in shooting, so it's it's super clutch. Uh, Race you know, it on go, fours naturally, right? Yes. <laughs> yep. So getting getting threes, threes, is threes is really big. It is. Yep. It's a big deal on that. Well, that being said, I do have a question on that to follow up with that. How often do you get aggressive with that, seeing the fact is that he doesn't have quantum shielding or anything, so you can put some serious wounds on him when you can see him? Do you tend to uh, keep him behind? Because he can be, even though he's 18 wounds, he can be obscured. So you can hide him effectively. Do you find yourself bringing him out late game? Does he come out early to bully? Does it matter to between which army you're playing against? Of course, like what 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 do you what's the usual style for you with um, the Sonic? So initially, when I first started playing him, I was very aggressive with him, and then I was taught lessons that you don't do that. Because <laughs> <laughs> um, he is, I mean, he's he's T seven and he's twenty six wounds total with the two Meneers. But the problem with him is that. Um, he dies easier than night with the T7. It's like a rotated knight. If you can take out a rotated knight, you can take him down. So I, I learned very quickly that you keep him behind an obscuring ruin for a couple turns at least. Uh, turn three is normally when I kind of make my move to bring him out. Um, so the first two turns is kind of me just trading pieces. That's what the Obphidians and the and the Wraiths are for. They just go out and kind of just trade on the objectives for a couple turns while I just kind of screen out my backfield and not, don't let anybody drop in behind me. And then turn three is kind of when I just push do the final push with like the Scorpic destroyers, the Silent King himself and the Locust destroyers going out and kind of putting, putting out as much damage as I can at that point. I'll give you that. I mean, 
he's a bad dude. I'm not going to lie. He's not somebody you want to find out his rules uh, during the game either. Uh, he does have a full page. He does some stuff. There's yep. things that happen when the Silent King hits the board. Yeah, and the other really clutch thing with the Silent King is, in my list, he's the only source that I have to deny, to deny psychic powers. So he has he denies like a psyker, and he has a four-up strat to deny within 18 inches. Nobody takes psychic interrogation against me, where they would normally take it against me. They normally take it against Necrons every game if he's not there, because he's going to deny everything. Because if I'm willing to burn 2CP, which Necrons, our strats are not that great. So you're more than willing to burn CPs to reroll like. Uh, <laughs> it's, just, it's just so funny that you go not that great. And as you said that in my head, I started trying to figure out any Necron strats that I've used in the past. And I'm There's like, the, the one that makes a shot auto wound that's yep. kind of cool. Uh, <laughs> yep. There's one um, for like an extra attack on a core unit, something like that. They're extra strength. There's an extra oh. strength. One. So, um, but there's also like the Scorpix have a neg one dam neg one to wound. In see, they, they, they have the neg one to wound. I would say I, I pop that all the time if you're playing. But your that's team. one CP. I mean, so and like the so like my list. I mean, I have an outrider plus a patrol and then the Silent King. But the Silent King gives me three. I take the relic for the. I spend one for relic and one for his warlord traits. I still start with four, even though I take an outrider. It's kind of insane. That is a big deal on that. Especially in the apocalypse environment that we're in now. <laughs> My list for ATC starts with zero CP. Yep. I love everything about that. Well, it, it, there's just uh, so many lists there that are hilarious like that. We found out that several of uh, Perry's old arc lists would have started at negative three CP <laughs> right now. <laughs> yep. Yeah, my towel is started at negative two. So it's like, nice. all right. um, one thing though that I did notice, like you, you mentioned, like the CP change and everything is um, interrupts never didn't happen as much. Your opponents can't interrupt on you. So it's almost like having an army wide fight last because they don't have the CP to interrupt you. You know, you just keep them burning the CP here and there to actually have two CP in, in your opponent's turn is huge because it raises that threat that they can't multi-charge you where there were several times where I opponent had one CP. I'm like, all right, everybody's coming out to play now because you can't interrupt me and I'm going to put that some damage a, on you. That's a great thing on that because I found out that was the biggest thing. Besides, obviously, once you get past army composition, it was you had the CP to do your normal ro CP rotation, basically. But what you didn't have is CP sitting in the bank for aspect scans and interrupts and everything else. You couldn't threaten as much stuff as you used to. Mm -hmm. And that's a big deal, especially with a combat army like yourself, because people want to be interrupting, interrupting, interrupting. But then if they do that, then they're not doing the rest of the things they want to do on their turn to make their army effective. Yep, 100 percent. Tell me some stuff for ATC this weekend, Quinn, and then I'm going to I'm going to send this into part two, otherwise known as. Again, it's the Brad thing, the dark, so, hot, the after dark. I was reading Scott's list and I was getting uh, really, it was really interested because my team has a Necron player who's running something very similar to this. Um, he doesn't have a squad of the big, the big warrior brick, but instead he has more um, of destroyers. I think he has a second squad of Scorpex. And there's a couple of other minor changes. He has some more Ophidians, that kind of thing. But the way you were describing is, the way he's been playing, which is Silent King Smout turn three. There's lots of little stuff that goes and constantly contests objectives. Um, and I found it to be really strong. And one of the things I found to be strongest about it is the secondary game plan is just so good. Um, the very first time we played against New Necrons and I didn't know what anything did, I was kind of not paying attention. I looked at the scoreboard and he had like 40 secondary points on like turn three. And I was like, <laughs> I was like, what just happened? <laughs> You didn't do any work. Yeah, I've scored 13 top of one secondary points. So crazy. That's literally I mean, so they need to be, it needs to be toned down. I mean, I'm yeah. going to... It's a big deal on that, too, because of the fact that you actually force your opponent into a certain style of play, because it's a big psychological factor when I look over at the board and you're like, hey, man, I just scored 13. I did, the, you know what I mean? And you scored two, you know, so, or whatever. Yeah. And that makes your opponent, even if they can go, okay, at the end of the game, it's going to be this, this, and this. It's it's hard to get past that psychological hurdle, basically, of going, I'm behind, I need to catch up, you know? I think another big thing that makes Necron so strong is that their secondaries are very non-interactive. Um, like, I play a lot of, I play Trikari, I play Crafter with Eldar, I play Tau, and a lot of their secondaries require you to interact with your opponent. Like, Trikari, the good ones, I have to kill units. Tau, I have to, like, kill units. Um 
Necrons, you don't. You have to just go and do an action here, grab a couple of points that are pretty easy with the pregame move and obsec everywhere, that kind of stuff. So if you're fighting an opponent who doesn't have really quality built-in secondaries and without strangleholds, a lot of factions just don't anymore. Um, you have, you go in with this massive points advantage that is kind of hard to see on the surface, but is huge in the long run. Because even if all your stuff is dying, you can get points that your opponent just can't make up. Those sticky objectives are such a... They, they, <laughs> your army's a nightmare on that. I've played Necrons against that. You, you do pregame move, and all of a sudden you score that in the command phase, and you push up, and even if I table you, you are you know what I mean? There could be zero people, obviously, on that objective with the sticky objectives, and you've been scoring those the entire game where you're like, I killed every single Necron. You're like, okay, what's the score? I lost by 30. <laughs> like, what happened? Yeah, yep, that's definitely a thing where... I mean, the biggest thing that I've learned with my opponents, the ones that have been able to beat my army and then compete with me is that you can't panic. Like, you know that the Necron player is going to rump the score, but you're going to table them. Yeah. The Necrons just, there's a lot of wounds, a lot of, a lot of good saves in there. And, and, but you're going to eventually take them out. There's just not that much there. They, they don't hit that hard. You're not going to lose models the way that at the same rate they do. So just go for like turns three through five to try and like max your primaries and win the game at that point. So. And that's been my experience starting to play against Necrons is like, really planning for those later terms and building strategy around those later terms and kind of taking that breath and being like, all right, what are secondaries I can score later? What are secondaries that require me to kill? What are things that don't require me to be doing stuff at the beginning, but can I can worry about later on? Yep. And and I mean, a few of my opponents like deep struck stuff, and that was such a mistake. My army is so, there's just so much there that you can just spread out and like, all right, I guess you can come down in your deployment zone or the back edge of your deployment zone. <laughs> or, or nowhere. Yeah. <laughs> yep, there is. Hope, hope for the best. Yeah, yeah. I played a Dark Angels player who put two units of uh, Terminators in reserves. I'm like, okay, it's going to be bad. <laughs> The question is, are you going to be there this weekend in American Team Championships? I am not. No, listen, uh, I was there, I think the last time they had one, I think I was at it. But uh, we didn't get a team set up this year. I know, I think Matt Root's going to be down there with the team, but he's the only guy from the Twin Cities areas that's going to make it down. So I'm not, I'm not, I'm not even mad. I'm just disappointed. <laughs> it, I, that is, I've only been there the one time, but it was easily one of the funnest events I've ever been to. And actually, it's kind of what really pushed me down more down the competitive road and made me a much, much better player. By going I'm so excited for it. Uh, team events are my thing. Uh, my jam, baby. That's, that's all I want to go to. Yeah. So Scott, thanks for hanging out with us today. Quinn, thanks for showing up in this fireside gathering. I feel safe. And stay tuned for part two when we go do the deep dive. Hold on. I got to do the, uh, the elite player mindset. There we go. Thanks. <laughs> I, I channel my inner Blake there for it. So stay tuned for part two, and we'll hope to see you soon. Like what you just listened to? Check out Art of War and the Art of War Down Under podcast on the competitive 40K network. The Art of War 40K.com.